Good morning and welcome back to Bush History. So far we have discussed the formation of the United States and I have gone through the administrations of Washington and Adams. And now we're in for a big change because the election of 1800 is called the Peaceful Revolution. Well, it's only peaceful because arms were not taken up from one side to another. It was actually a, a, a quite a heated battle between the Adams camp and the Jefferson's camp. The Adams camp being the Federalists, of course, they want their man re-elected. And the Alien and Sedition Act did a good job of some reading that. And, of course, you have the Democratic Republicans who want their man, Thomas Jefferson, elected. Well, in the election of 1800, the Democratic Republicans are going to win, and Thomas Jefferson will become the third president of the United States. Now, if you remember, Thomas Jefferson was pretty much of an anti-federalist. He did not believe in this strong, unified national government as much as a lot of his other founding fathers did. And if you take a look at the Declaration of Independence, it flies in the face of the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence talking all about individual freedoms and self-determination, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, all of that stuff, and the Constitution really coming in play and putting a set of guidelines and rules and regulations into place. So, Thomas Jefferson is going to become president in 1801, and John Adams is so upset about this that, first of all, he's not there for the inauguration. He leaves and he goes home. And secondly, in the closing days and hours of his administration, he tries to appoint a series of Federalist judges, hoping to keep Federalist influence in the court system as a way of not necessarily usurping, but making sure that Thomas Jefferson could not completely undo everything the Federalists had done. So, in this presentation, I'm going to take a look at several things, and I'm going to use a, a variety of visuals to do so. I'm going to start take, with the idea that we would call this the agrarian republic. The idea that Thomas Jefferson becomes president of the United States changes the way that, once again, the, the government looks at itself. We're going to have three Democratic Republican presidents in a row. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, James Monroe. They call them the Virginia dynasty for the reason that they're all from Virginia. They're also all Democratic Republicans. They're also all close political allies. So we're going to have 24 years of a very unified look at how the government should run, yet it will still evolve. We're going to start out as an agrarian republic and we're going to turn into a market economy over the next 24 years. And what we're going to deal with specifically is, in this presentation, the peaceful revolution, the idea of agrarianism that we can or should be a nation of farmers according to Thomas Jefferson, uh, Marbury versus Madison in 1803, which was going to be as a result of the parting shot in the Midnight Judges from uh, John Adams, and I'm going to do a completely separate presentation on pivotal Supreme Court cases in which Marbury will be explained in detail. In this particular presentation, some of the details will be on the summary level as opposed to specific. We have the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. I'm going to go into the War of 1812, the war that probably should never have been fought, the American system, which is a uh, reuse or return to Hamiltonian economics in a big way under Henry Clay, and the era of good feelings. This is all going to take place between 1801 and 1824. So it's going to be a very busy 24-year time period in which the child takes its first steps. If you take a look at the United States of, of America, United States government, the Federalist era, we have the infancy. We have the, the government is getting in place and the government is figuring out how it works. Well, then we're going to go to the Republican era or the agrarian republic, if you like, and now that child is going to take its first steps. So hold on one second. I want to cue up a visual for you and I'll be right back. The time period I'm talking about here with this Virginia dynasty starts up here in 1801 and extends all the way down through 1825 to the inauguration of John Quincy Adams, son of John Adams. So the Adamses, if you like, they frame this agrarian republic, one at the beginning and one at the very end. Although it's important to understand Quincy Adams is not part of it. He comes after the agrarian republic. He comes after James Monroe. So anyway, we start out, Thomas Jefferson comes into office in 1801 
And Thomas Jefferson has to deal with the Midnight Judges. Midnight Judges was a series of Federalist judges that John Adams had nominated for appointments prior to leaving office, just before leaving office, hence the term Midnight Judges. And he had given these appointments to his good friend and Secretary of State, John Marshall. And John Marshall was one of these Midnight Judges. So John Marshall had this packet, if you like, an envelope, could have been a box for all I know, of appointments that he's supposed to deliver to the Senate, because the Senate is responsible for approving presidential appointments under checks and balances. So John Marshall doesn't do that. He only delivers one. He delivers his own. The rest of them, he doesn't deliver. Now, history is kind of curious as to why. Does John Marshall realize that installing these Federalist judges is too much of a power play for John Adams and will handicap Thomas Jefferson and the United States as we go forward? Does he think this is wrong? It's hard to tell. But we do know that John Marshall will become Chief Justice of the Supreme Court as a result of delivering his own appointment, doesn't deliver any others, just his own, and he will ultimately judge the granddaddy case of them all, Marbury versus Madison, in which really Marbury is going to sue for his position as a Justice of the Peace, a relatively low justice to marriages, a couple of parking tickets for horses, you know, Clem, you drop some trash over there, you gotta pick it up. It wasn't a big deal, but Marbury wanted this. So that's how we're gonna kick off this whole idea of midnight judges. And that'll be that'll become a Supreme Court case in 1803 by the time it works its way through all the procedures. Also in 1803, we're going to have the Louisiana Purchase, the Louisiana Purchase in, and that's going to double the size of the United States. There's gonna be a huge debate whether Thomas Jefferson actually has the ability to do that. Thomas Jefferson is a strict constructionist. He believes that if the Constitution does not say it, he can't do it. So now you have a problem, because we also know Thomas Jefferson is an expansionist. We know he's an expansionist because he wrote the Land Ordinance of 1785 and the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, both plans for expanding into the Ohio Valley. I'm going to take a look at a map, and I'll show you that in a second. So then, what happens is he wants to double the size of the United States. He wants to purchase Louisiana. So, just hold on one second. I want to show you what we're talking about. I'm going to take a pause and I'm going to switch the graphic. So here we go. Here's a map of the United States. And this is going to be the debate that Thomas Jefferson is going to find himself engaged in. At the beginning of Thomas Jefferson's presidency, the United States went from the Atlantic coast to the Ohio Valley. Remember, the Ohio Valley was in here, and that was the area that was fought for initially in the French and Indian War. And with the coming of the American Revolution and the victory by the colonists, this becomes part of the United States. So this is the United States Thomas Jefferson inherits. The Atlantic coast to the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River is a jagged line. It heads up into the Ohio River and the Missouri River. And eventually, you end up with the Great Lakes. Very, very important. Well. He wants the port of New Orleans. Thomas Jefferson wants the port of New Orleans, which is right down here. And as a result of Pinckney's Treaty, New Orleans has been internationalized. But Thomas Jefferson wants to own New Orleans. So he ends up in negotiations with Napoleon. Because in a secret deal, the land has transferred from Spain to France. So now France owns this land. But Napoleon is too busy fighting his Napoleonic Wars. And he wants a lot of money. So he really wants to sell. New Orleans. So Thomas Jefferson wants to buy New Orleans. So if you get a buyer and you get a seller, you generally end up with a deal. But the deal is going to be unbelievable. Because Napoleon is going to turn around and say, listen, if I got a deal for you, instead of New Orleans, instead of New Orleans, we'll give you New Orleans. And we'll give you all of this heading up to the Rocky Mountains, which we now know as the Louisiana Territory. So it's going to go like this. It's going to be this huge chunk of land. It's going to double the size of the United States. Thomas Jefferson wants it very badly, but he doesn't know what to do about it. What should I do? What should I do? If I buy it, I'm a hypocrite because I'm a strict constructionist and there's nothing in the Constitution about the United States government purchasing land. If I don't buy it, I'm stupid because I can double the size of the United States. I'm an agrarian. We're all farmers. Now we have more farmland. So Thomas Jefferson, oh, woe is me. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Of course. 
Fortunately for him, Alexander Hamilton is dead. Because Alexander Hamilton, if he had not been killed in a duel with Aaron Burr, would have said, ha, I told you, I told you. You can't be this strict agrarian because it's not going to work. Sometimes the government needs a lot of power. So Thomas Jefferson anguishes over this, and he comes up with a way to do it. It's called Article 1, Section 8, Number 18 of the U.S. Constitution. It's called the Necessary and Proper Clause, or the Elastic Clause. And really what it says is, and you should take a look at this, you should take a look at Article 1, first article of the Constitution. Really what it says is that the United States government can do what is ever necessary and proper to fulfill the goals of the United States. So that the, the legislative branch, Congress, can do whatever is necessary. So necessary is buying the land. So Congress buys the land for $15 million. They double the size of the United States. This is the high water mark of the Jefferson presidency. Because look what he's done. He's made his agrarian republic happen. He's doubled the size of the United States. And he's given the United States full control of the Mississippi River. And that means we control all trade, all commerce, going from the Gulf of Mexico to the Great Lakes. We control both sides of it. It's going to end up, unfortunately, being a major slave passage, which is what being sold down the Mississippi or down the river means. But we're also going to get all of this land. Of course, it's not states. This is a political map representing the present of the United States. But we get all of this land. I'm going to grow into all this land. It's going to be a wonderful thing for Jefferson president for $15 million. There are people in the United States today that have houses that cost more than $15 million. This is an incredible deal. And it's going to use the, the elastic clause, Article 1, Section 8, Number 18. Okay, I want to go back to that timeline I put together. So hold on one second. So with the successful purchase of Louisiana in 1803, Thomas Jefferson is riding high. And he easily, easily wins re-election in 1804 with his Republican agrarian philosophy. He's going to defund the government as much as he can. He's going to lower taxes. He's going to essentially get rid of the military. And we're going to live as farmers in our new land in this Louisiana territory. And things are going well. Not so much. Because on the Atlantic Ocean, the British and the French are having a never-ending series of conflicts. And what starts to happen is both sides start to pirate our ships. They start to pirate our ships because we're selling agricultural products, food, to both sides. Well, so what happens is, in 1807, Thomas Jefferson issues the Embargo Act. And the Embargo Act says, we're not going to trade with anybody. We don't need to trade with the French. We don't need to trade with the British. We are farmers. We can supply our own food and our own goods. Nice idea, Mr. President. Horrible for the nation. Because think about what goes into international trade. Certainly you have the whole shipping industry in the Northeast. So all the shipbuilders, they're not building ships now. Because why can you build ships if you can't sell them? Which kills the transportation industry and all of the jobs that were involved in the transportation industry. Which kills the movement of goods to the Atlantic ports because where are they going to sell those goods? So it really throws the country into a huge economic downturn. It's a bit of a recession. It's an early recession for the United States. And Thomas Jefferson's agrarian republic is shown to be flawed because we actually produce too much and we need to sell what we've been producing because we've introduced the idea of surplus at this time. Surplus, the idea that farmers could indeed produce more than they needed because they were selling. Surplus because more lumber could be cut down than we needed and it was being sold. So now we have a lot of it. And that surplus is going to lead to something called the market revolution where markets are going to start to form. And Bob's going to bring his potatoes and Clem is going to bring his carrots and Jeff's going to bring his rutabagas and somebody's going to bring avocados and somebody's going to bring cherries. And they're going to lay these things out and they're going to sell them in these markets. Now there's a story that probably isn't true but it's fun anyway. Um, Five guys, Bob, Clem, Gus, Charlie, and Frank, all sell potatoes. So they bring them to this market. Now, a potato is a potato, a potato. And how can you tell Frank's potatoes from Gus's potatoes? So Frank says, oh, I got an idea. Let's put a mark on it. And Gus says, great. So people start marking the products they have in these gatherings. Hence the term market. They marked it. So you can tell one from the other. 
probably more folktale than reality, but it kind of makes the point that now we're going to sell things at markets because we have a market revolution and we have surplus. With this huge amount of land and the ability to farm this tremendous amount of land that we have, and frankly not needing everything we farm, we're going to have a, start, a change in American society. Not everyone's going to be a farmer. Some people are going to be farmers for sure. The predominant amount of people will be farmers. But people are going to start to move and live in cities and villages and towns. And they're going to buy the products of the farmers. Hence, the market revolution that's going to occur in this time period. We're also, we also have the introduction of the cotton gin, which occurred in 1893. So cotton will start to be sold in the marketplace as well. And we're going to have mechanization from Sam Slater and the whole idea of the mill system that brings over from Europe. So those things are occurring in the United States and we're less of an agrarian society than Thomas Jefferson would like us to be, which means if we cut off trade in 1807 with the rest of the world, we're going to have this huge economic downturn. And we do. And the genius of Thomas Jefferson with the Louisiana Purchase of 1803 has escaped him. And in 1807, the economy is going to tank. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. And of course, as a result of that, he's going to be not so much the wise founding father and architect of this peaceful, sleepy agrarian republic as he's going to be the maker of this really bad idea. Nevertheless, in 1808, Thomas Jefferson decides not to run for re-election. His popularity was an all-time low. He probably doesn't win anyway. And he anoints his Secretary of State, James Madison, the James Madison of Marbury versus Madison. And James Madison had become President of the United States. Now James Madison had a bit of the Federalist in him, if you remember, because he writes the Constitution. You have to have a bit of the Federalist in you if you are a writer of the Constitution. So he doesn't see 100% eye to eye with Thomas Jefferson. And that's okay, you can disagree. You can have some disagreements. James Madison believes that this Embargo Act is a mistake. So the first thing he does in 1809, when he assumes office, is he repeals the Embargo Act and he replaces it instead with something called Macon's Bill Number Two. Don't worry about Number One. I'm not going to go into it. Macon's Bill Number Two basically says we will trade with non-belligerent nations. So what happens? The French and the British say, "Oh, we need American trade," and they jump on board and we restore trade on the Atlantic coast. Well, as a result of Macon's Bill Number Two, so now we're trading again. And the economy is improving as a result of this trade. And we also pass, he also passes the Non-Intercourse Act, which forbids trade with the Indians in the Ohio Valley. Also a bad idea, but we all have good ideas and bad ideas, and that was a bad idea. So we've restored trade internationally, and we've cut off trade domestically with the various Native Americans. So that's the beginning of James Madison's presidency, but it begins fairly well. So nevertheless, we're going into the 1809, 1810, we just talked about 90, that? 1811, we have a funny thing that's occurring in 1811. Being that we're trading on the Atlantic, we're also trading with the French, and the British don't like the fact we're trading with the French. So the British start pirating our ships again. It's called impressment. They are impressing American sailors into the British Navy, claiming they were never independent in the first place. Now this is a tough thing, because uh, Congress doesn't know what to do with this, and Madison doesn't know what to do with this. We're really not in a position to fight the British government over this, yet they are pirating our ships. So there's a clamoring, especially in the southern part of the country, to go to war. Henry Clay leads a group of uh, people in Congress called the War Hawks, and they want to go to war against the British. Well, there's a strong feeling not to do that as well. It's, it's kind of like, do we or do we not? There's not enough evidence. And then, in 1811, we get the smoking gun. The Battle of Tippy Canoe. This is the Tippy Canoe River, and at the Battle of Tippy Canoe, William Henry Harrison leads the Continental Army against a group of Indians. And when the battle is over, it's found that these Native Americans, these Indians, had weapons that were made in England. Now, how would they get those weapons? How would Native Americans get rifles from the British? So Henry Clay cries, cries, they're getting us, they're getting us. They're impressing our sailors on the Atlantic and they're going into the Ohio Valley. Remember that area in the Ohio Valley? They're going into the Ohio Valley, they're arming our enemies, the Native Americans. We have to do something, we have to do something, we have to go to war. So he screams and shouts and screams and shouts and threatens 
James Madison with the loss of the vote of these group of Warhawks. And the Warhawks are, you know, Southern Republicans who want to go to war against England to protect their trade interests. Now the Northerners, the pocket of Federalists in the North, in the Northeast, specifically Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, they don't want to go to war. But nevertheless, James Madison has his arm turned behind his back and he says, well, I guess I'm going to war. And he asks Congress for a declaration of war. And strangely enough, strangely enough, right at about that time, the British agree to stop compressing American sailors. Not enough. Not enough to stop the wheels of motion that have gone into play. And sure enough, we are going to declare war against the British. It was a really bold move, declaring war against the most powerful nation in the world. We got lucky the first time. Not necessarily true that we didn't get lucky the second time. So nevertheless, War of 1812 begins in 1812, obviously, and it's going to end in 1814. As I said, I'm going to go through this chapter and verse, trying to walk you through the time period. So it ends in 1814 with the Treaty of Ghent, and Ghent is in Belgium. And then in 1815, in January of 1815, nobody tells Andrew Jackson, and we have the Battle of New Orleans. And the Battle of New Orleans is a wonderful victory. The war is actually over, but Andrew Jackson is defending New Orleans. And he defeats the British in a resounding way, and he becomes a folk hero. Certainly will help him when he runs for President of the United States. We have a tariff in 1816 as part of the new American system. That's Henry Clay's idea to rebuild the American economy after the failure of Republican agrarianism. The American system is going to be a system built on tariffs on international trade. Imports only. There are no tariffs on exports because a tariff on an import is thought to protect young American industry. You don't want to put a tariff on an export because that would make American industrial products more expensive overseas. So we have a tariff. We have a banking system to take that money from the tariff and then we have a system of infrastructure. Let's build roads and canals and things like that. Imports to bolster the American economy. So that is Henry Clay's American system. So we get a tariff in 1816 on imported goods. In 1817, we're going to negotiate the border between the United States and Canada as far as the Great Lakes. And that's going to be the Rush of Got Treaty. So that's going to solidify our border to the north. So our border to the east, obviously, the Atlantic Ocean. Our border to the west is the foothills of the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Our border to the south is the Gulf of Mexico. And the Rush of Got Treaty is going to cement the northern border of the United States that goes east and west of the Atlantic the Pacific. So, in 1816, James Monroe is going to become President of the United States, following in this pattern of the Secretary of State becoming President of the United States. James Monroe was James Madison's Secretary of State. He's going to become President in 1817 after winning the election of 1816. Things are going well in the country, and people want to continue this democratic republicanism that has occurred. Now, we've changed, though. We start out as this agrarian nation, and with the failure of the Embargo Act, James Madison realized we weren't so agrarian. And he embraces Hamiltonian economics revisited by Henry Clay. So we have the development of this American system. Well, James Monroe is going to continue that idea. And one of the things that's going to occur is he's going to take a good deal of Federalists into his cabinet, thereby bringing the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans together. So then, we're going to enter into this time period that's going to be called the era of good feelings, which actually is more around the 1819, 1820 time period. Nevertheless, James Monroe is going to become president of the United States. And first thing he's going to have to really deal with that's a problem because the economy is, is expanding, is in 1819 we're going to get a bank panic. With the expansion of the economy, the economy becomes speculation. And there's a lot of borrowing, a lot of borrowing to buy land in the new west. There's a lot of new investment as a result of the ending of the War of 1812 where people are free to head west without dealing with any kind of British incursions. The whole idea of marketing products has caused people to buy large tracts of land to farm. And now, with the end of conflict between the British and the French, we don't have to trade with both of them as much. They don't need our products as much. They're actually starting to trade a little bit with each other. And they're also not producing as much, in, as much materials for war as they needed. So international trade drops off, and the banking system starts to become starved for money because those tariffs have started to decrease. The tariffs are still in play, mind you, but there's less international trade, and we need international trade. So what the banks start to do is they start to call in mortgages on land. 
Well, the people don't have the money to pay these mortgages on this land that they invested in. And that's going to lead to a bank panic. Bank panic is going to occur a lot in American history. And anytime you hear the word panic, it's a general downturn. There are panics, there are recessions, and there are depressions. And that's kind of the order of severity. A bank panic is a run on the banks, there's not enough money in the banks. A recession often follows a bank panic, and a depression is an extended period of unemployment and economic decline. Now we measure it with gross domestic product, but we're not going to worry about that right now. So, this panic occurs in 1819, and none other than Andrew Jackson is going to lose his family fortune in it. So Andrew Jackson is not going to like the banking system, and we're going to visit that when we get to Andrew Jackson's presidency. Also in 1819, we come up with a way to purchase Mickey Mouse land. We're going to buy Florida. We're going to buy Florida from the Spanish in something called the adams Onis Treaty. So we're going to get the peninsula of Florida from the Spanish. They don't have a navy anymore anyway. I mean, they gave the whole Louisiana territory away to Napoleon pretty much in a secret deal. And now they're selling their last vestige on the North American part of the Americas to the United States in the adams Onis deal. After all, you can't expand west from Florida anyway. It's largely useless. Andrew Jackson is going into Florida and he's going after the Seminole Indians. They will survive him, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be the Indian Wars in Florida. The Spanish can't protect them, so they might as well sell the land before they lose it anyway. And that's going to be the adams Onis treaty. So that's going to occur in 1819 as well. So now we're going to move forward into 1820, into the Missouri Crisis. The problem here is Missouri wants to enter the United States as a slave state. We haven't had states entering. And now Missouri wants to enter as a slave state. And if Missouri enters, it's going to swing the balance in Congress towards, specifically the House of Representatives, towards the slaveholding states. Which means they're going to have more power in the legislative branch than the non-slaveholding states and the free states. And that is a problem. Really quick, let's take a look at the maps. Let me cue this up. Here's Missouri. Right smack dab in the middle of the country. And it wants to be a slave state. Well, the northern is saying it can't be a slave state. Look how north it is. And the southern is saying, of course it's a slave state. Look how far south it is. So now we have a problem. As I said, it throws off the balance in Congress. Well, strange enough, at exactly the same time, and it's really just a coincidence, Maine decides it wants to enter. It's a territory that's carved from other states and parts of southern Canada. And it wants to enter the United States as well, as a free state, because slaves aren't doing much in Maine winters. So it's going to enter as a free state, or it wants to enter as a free state. So Henry Clay comes up with a genius, obvious idea. Maine enters as a free state. Missouri enters as a slave state. The balance maintained. Everybody is happy. One more part of this. There will be no slavery north of the southern border of Missouri with the exception of Missouri. So Kansas supposedly can't be slave territory, nor can Kentucky or Illinois or Iowa. Only Missouri. Everything south, okay. Everything north, not so good. And that will be a big problem as we expand later on as well, because Missouri Compromise will be challenged. But that's essentially it. And we're going to live with that Missouri Compromise all the way to 1850. So for the next 30 years, it's going to work. And Henry Clay is given the title of the great pacificator or the great compromiser because he's the architect of these things. Henry Clay is around a long time. Look, he's the architect of the American system. He's the architect of the bank. He is the architect of the Missouri Compromise. So he's going to be around for a while. And he will be around all the way up into the 1850s, along with Daniel Webster and John C. Cowan. These three guys are going to be the three preeminent, most powerful um, politicians of that era. Sometimes you get that in American history. You get a guy like Ted Kennedy, for example, who was, pre who was president, he was never president, he wanted to be president, who was a senator from the early 1960s all the way up until 2008. Actually, I think it was 2009. He was around a long, long time. So you get these politicians who have been around for a very long time, and these three guys, will. Henry Clay is going to be the first one of them on the scene. The Missouri Compromise in 1820 is going to settle the issue of slavery for the next 30 years. And then we're going to go into a relatively quiet time period. In 1823, we're going to get the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine is going to cement American foreign policy. I'm going to do it as a separate discussion, but basically it tells the Europeans to stay out 
of North America, and we will stay out of Europe. This is some thought that they're going to be recolonizing. And, of course, the United States will want to be recolonized. An important point about the Monroe Doctrine, as a document, it exists nowhere. It's part of a speech by James Monroe given to Congress in 1823. There are various paragraphs that have been put together that are called the Monroe Doctrine, but it's not a piece of paper unto itself. So moving forward, 1824, we're going to get a yee-haw of an election. And that election is going to end up with Quincy Adams as President of the United States. There are four candidates running for President in 1824. Well, four candidates, not a good idea. We're going to end up with two. We're going to end up with Quincy Adams against Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson is going to win the popular vote. But he doesn't win a majority of the electoral votes. Quincy Adams certainly doesn't have a majority of electoral votes, and he doesn't have a majority of the popular vote. But one of the other candidates was Henry Clay. And Henry Clay was the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And he and Andrew Jackson didn't think too kindly of each other. And they're going to hate each other more as time goes on. So the election is thrown at the House of Representatives. And Henry Clay had you know, since dropped out of this. And now we are Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams fighting for ascension from the House of Representatives to the Presidency of the United States. So Henry Clay gives his long bellicose speech in which he turns around and says he thinks Andrew Jackson is not good enough to be President of the United States, but Quincy Adams is. And that Quincy Adams will lead us and that Andrew Jackson is too hot-headed and he's too impulsive and that Quincy Adams is thoughtful and that he will do things along the Federalist lines. We've had these Democratic Republicans for a long time. So he stands up and he nominates Quincy Adams to be President of the United States, and he asks all of his supporters to support Quincy Adams. Well, Andrew Jackson jumps up and down screaming. He says, this is corrupt. You can't do this. This is a bargain of biblical proportions. You're giving the presidency to Quincy Adams. Every place is nothing. And Quincy Adams becomes President of the United States. So now, Andrew Jackson dislikes Quincy Adams even more because the man who didn't win the majority of the popular vote becomes President of the United States. And by the way, 1824 is the first time the popular vote is actually reported. Prior to that, it was only the electoral vote, so you didn't know who won the popular vote in the nation. You couldn't really judge a candidate's popularity, but now you can. And Andrew Jackson knows he's more popular than Quincy Adams, and Andrew Jackson thinks he should have been President. So what's going to happen is for the next four years, the, Ad the, the uh, Jackson people are going to make the Adams people miserable. And it's going to be known as four miserable years. As a matter of fact, when Quincy Adams becomes president, he gets a communication from his dad, John Adams. I differentiate, by the way. It's John Quincy Adams, I understand that, but I call him Quincy so we don't make the confusion. Anyway, Quincy Adams gets a communication from his father, John Adams, along the lines of, um, I wish you well as President of the United States, but this is going to be a tough time for you. So congratulating you isn't something I really feel like I should do. So that's a hell of a way for a father to message a son as, uh, as he's become President of the United States. All right, I want to take a look at a PowerPoint that kind of sums this stuff up. So let's take a break here for a moment. So let's take a look. Once again, this is out of a uh, Farragher's, or his reference with Farragher's out of many. All of these PowerPoints and all this information is available on bushhistory.net slash YouTube. So you can take a look there and you will get the accompanying materials that go along with this. But nevertheless, let's take a look. So here we have Thomas Jefferson on the right, and we have nondescript Native American on the left, kind of idealized Hollywood version sketch of it. So let's take a look. Once we get into this time period, there are competing forces on what we know as North America. And North America is divided. There are Russians, there are Germans, there are Spanish, and all these people are trying to get control. Eh, control is probably the wrong world. They're trying to get some kind of economic benefit from North America. And the United States wants to expand. So that's going back to the whole idea of the Louisiana Purchase. If we can expand, maybe we can get rid of some of these foreign influences on North America. The idea that we have a national economy is going to come from this. The fact that 
Now we are trading. There's a market revolution. We are trading intra-nation, interstate. In other words, the South is selling things to the North. The North is selling things to the South. The West is selling things to the North and South. And we are also trading things to the Europeans. <coughs> so Thomas Jefferson becomes President of the United States in 1801. We have an idea of Marbury versus Madison, mentioned it a few minutes ago. And Thomas Jefferson pretty much promised to cut taxes and cut the size of our military. And he does. He does all of those things because he does not believe that we need them. He believes it was overkill, too much power um, in the hands of the federal government, the federal system. And we're going to end up with Marbury versus Madison. And by the way, when John Marshall ultimately rules in Marbury versus Madison, he's not going to rule for Marbury or Madison. What he's going to do is turn around and say the Judiciary Act of 1789 is largely unconstitutional. And that's going to take away some of the power to appoint unlimited judges, for one. And it's going to take away the ability of the federal court system to have original jurisdiction. Because in reality, local courts, state courts, should have original jurisdiction for things that occur within the states. So John Marshall is going to weasel his way out of having to decide four atoms. Because if he decides four atoms, Marbury gets his job. And if he decides for Jefferson, uh, Madison wins and Marbury doesn't get his job. So instead he makes a procedural decision. And he says the Judiciary Act of 1789 is unconstitutional in many ways. So that outlines the idea or cements the idea of judicial review. And that's going to occur in the beginning of 1803, March specifically of 1803. So if you take a look at this slide, this is the Louisiana Territory, all of this. And this is what Thomas Jefferson is going to find a way to get Congress to purchase. Remember, Thomas Jefferson doesn't purchase it. Congress does. I've heard time and time again say when Jefferson purchased Louisiana. Not true. It might have been during the Jefferson administration. He certainly has hands all over, but the president doesn't have that kind of power. Congress appropriates money, and Congress approves treaties. This is going to be a treaty. So Congress has to approve the treaty, and they have to appropriate the money. It was $15 million. So moving along now, now we're going to get to the idea of the War of 1812 and what's leading up to it. We want to be neutral, no political alliance. We want to be neutral, but at the same time, our ships are being impressed. They're being impressed by the British, and it's hard for us to remain neutral. Well, ultimately, the best way to remain neutral is going to be not trade with anybody, and that's the whole Embargo Act idea. And that's going to be a huge downfall for the American people, as I mentioned earlier. And we have it right here. Uh, in order to combat this, Congress imposed a boycott. This, however, ended in failure, and so the Embargo Act of 1807 was passed. The Embargo Act failed to change British policy, and it simply caused a recession in the United States as a result of that. And now we have the whole idea of what do we do with the Indians on our frontier. There's something called the Pan-Indian Movement occurring. The Pan-Indian Movement is orchestration by Tenskwada and Tecumseh, and they're going to try to bring the Indians together in a final pitched battle against the encroaching um, Americans as they start to head west. Um, Tenskwada predicted that if the Indians simply rose up, that the white men would disappear, that they'd be able to overpower them. Well, it's not going to work, but it, nevertheless, it's an organization and a joining of the various Native American groups. So now we're going to the War of 1812. Remember, the Warhawks were a group that was largely controlled by Henry Clay. Henry Clay was from Kentucky, so not technically a Southern, but South compared to the Federalists in the North. Here's Kentucky and here's the Northeast. And he wants to go to war because of the Battle of Tippecanoe and because of the impression of American sailors. So we end up going to war, they call it the Second War, for, for American independence in a lot of cases. And there wasn't much of a war. There were a lot of battles. The, you know, the battles were short and they were brief. The capital is going to be burned. Dolly Madison is going to have to run out of the capital carrying the painting of George Washington. The capital is shelled. We get Francis Scott Key, who, by the way, at Fort McHenry is a guest. He is not a prisoner. He was sent there as an emissary. So he was put up overnight there to protect him. And he writes this very long poem. We know it's the Star Spangled Banner. If you take time to read the entire poem, it's much longer than 
the patriotic song that we sing. As a matter of fact, it questions Americans and their ability to win this war. It was not written as a flag-waving um, song. It was written as an observation of events that were occurring during the war. Francis Scott Key was not a prisoner. He was a guest. Because do you really think they would have let a prisoner watch from a window and write poetry about a battle? It really doesn't make sense. So look that one up on your own, but it's interesting to actually see the words of the entire, um, the entire Star Spangled Banner. So in the case, the war ends in 1814. We get the Treaty of Gay, which reaffirms everything that was written in the original Treaty of Paris after the Revolution. The British will remove their soldiers from um, American shores. They will remove all their soldiers that might be in the Ohio Valley, and they will respect American shipping. And that really is the way it ends. Kind of ends with a whimper. There are more details to it, but I'd rather not go into that. You can read that and you can do more of that in class yourself. But nevertheless, that's the War of 1812. So now we're back on our feet again and we're growing again. We now want to head further into the frontier. We want to go further out west. So as the farmlands became more and more populated, people wanted to go west. They wanted to go west, one, for their own farms, and two, because they wanted to make their own way as the market revolution and the embargo acts had shown that if you produce too much, you're going to end up with lower prices. So people heading west. And an interesting phenomenon occurs called the Second Great Awakening. Second Great Awakening, as the original Great Awakening, was largely led by women. It was an attempt to get men to return to the church and to restore the family. The family being the nucleus of everything that's going on in the United States, and Catherine Beecher is going to address that in women's roles later on. But nevertheless, the women's, the women's movement, if you want, um, is definitely part of the Second Great Awakening. And this is where we start to get churches being more social. We start to have church dinners and dances. And who knows, maybe even bingo, so maybe the, the guys can come and gamble at church as well. But Second Great Awakening, nevertheless, is a movement of democracy, if you want, in the church where there's going to be more participation, more families, and it's an attempt to make not just women the, uh, the churchgoers and the participants, but men as well, and bring the family back into the church. And it's going to be pretty successful. In 1816, James Monroe becomes president, and they're going to call his presidency the era of good feelings. The year of good feelings, first of all, because the economy is doing well. Second of all, because he takes, as I said earlier, uh, Federalists and brings them into his cabinet, so much to the point that in 1820, he's pretty much, he pretty much runs unopposed to be President of the United States again for his second term. Can you imagine that happening? Imagine any president running unopposed. Well, sure, George Washington, but that's pretty much it. So things were going well. We had adjusted our borders with the rush Bagot Treaty of 1817. We had gotten uh, Florida with the adams Owens Treaty of 1819. We had survived the Panic of 1819. We had settled the Missouri Crisis of 1820. James Monroe was looking at it as a pretty good guy, like he could do no wrong. And that's how we're going to head into his second administration. And things go fairly well. And then we get the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine, which we're cementing American foreign policy, it was a big bluff. But nevertheless, it worked because the rest of the world listened to it. And they listened to it all the way up until Teddy Roosevelt, where he adds a Roosevelt corollary to it. So it establishes the United States basically as the policeman of the Americas. So that worked as well. So that's why Monroe is, um, presides over an era called the era of good feelings. Remember, um, James Madison had been Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of State ascends to the presidency. Um, James Monroe had been James Madison's Secretary of State, ascends to the presidency. So now we believe, or Quincy Adams believes, that as James Monroe's Secretary of State, he should ascend to the presidency as well. And Quincy Adams is a genius, but like his father, he is his father's son, he's difficult to get along with. He's like that smart kid in class who has to tell everybody how smart he is. And that's going to be Quincy Adams as was it, his father as well. So, what happens is, um, we're going to head into 1824 and Adams is going to run for president, as I said earlier, against Andrew Jackson, and after a protracted battle, he will win. And that is the official end of the era of good feelings, because now it's like the era of 
embattled presidents because Quincy Adams didn't have an embattled presidency in which he's largely going to be a failure, followed by Andrew Jackson, who's going to have an embattled presidency where he seems to be able to do whatever he wants. Um, it's difficult to judge success or failure, but he certainly is going to be an incredibly powerful president. He's going to have an, oh, a whole age named after him, the age of Jackson, but that's for another topic. So we talked about the panic, and one of the things that occurred during the panic was that farmers were losing their farms. So Congress passed stay laws. Stay laws basically meant that you could not be thrown off your land that you had to negotiate with the banks, so the banks had to negotiate with you as a way to stay on your land. We've had that recently during the economic crisis of the 2008-2010 period during the whole foreclosure mess and the short sales and stuff like that where people could negotiate as well. So this is kind of where it's occurring earlier in the United States. We have these series of protective tariffs. Protective tariffs made things more expensive for Southerners because they were importing a lot of stuff into the United States. And that's all participating in this panic of 1819. We talked about the Missouri Compromise of 1820. And you see it here. Here is Missouri. Missouri has the hash marks across it. Missouri is going to be free. I'm sorry. Missouri has the hash marks across it. Missouri is going to be slave. And Maine is going to be free. And everything north of Missouri's southern border is supposed to be free, and everything south is supposed to be slave. So Missouri's going to stick up like a pimple in the middle of the United States. All right, let's take a quick break. This is a complete note set of the time period that I'd like to go through with you. And it says, chapter nine notes, yes, if you're using Farragher's out of many, it's chapter nine, but it's still all about the agrarian republic. So we have the idea that there are European communities on North America, what we now call the continent of the United States. The Russians are out in the northwest area, which we call Oregon. And the Spanish and France are sharing this Louisiana territory at the beginning of the Jefferson presidency. So we have the United States, Spain, Russia, and the British as well, because they're still playing around in the Ohio Valley, even though they don't belong there. So that's going to cause problems as we head forward. We also have the idea of the Burr and Hamilton duel. Um, Aaron Burr was Jefferson's vice president, and he had a dispute with Alexander Hamilton. So when we hawk in New Jersey, after a lot of names were called back and forth, in which uh, Burr picked on Hamilton's wife and questioned his gentlemanliness, if you like, and his honor, we end up in a duel. And of course, Burr kills Hamilton in a now famous duel. And then Burr tries to orchestrate and overthrow the American government with the help of the Mexicans. It's called the Burr Conspiracy. Interesting reading. Um, Take a look at it. Aaron Burr was obviously not successful in any of that. We also have this idea that there's a national economy. We have these ports. We have these Atlantic ports. Uh, Philadelphia, Baltimore, New Orleans being the biggest one. You notice you don't see New York there because New York is still developing. And these ports, these ports are carrying major international trade. And that international trade is fueling a burgeoning American economy. It's fueling transportation for sure. It's fueling farming, it's fueling lumber, it's fueling the various artisans who are making things from the lumber and our resource. It's fueling, it's fueling the exportation of a variety of American goods and the American economy is growing. Um, the extra that we were making led to what was called the market revolution as a result of that. And banking is going to expand. But a funny thing occurs. Different parts of the country are participating differently in this. The South, with the advent of the cotton gin, has now found a way to make cotton very profitable. So they're primarily exporting cotton, and they're not mechanizing. They're using slavery. And their primary partner, by the way, in this export, in this trade, is England. So England is buying mostly southern cotton, which English aren't too thrilled with because they're anti-slavery, but they like their cotton. The North, on the other hand, is exporting a lot of raw materials, and they are mechanizing. And the West is doing its own thing. It's developing the myth of the frontiers. People are heading west, and they are farming, and they are taking some of the raw materials that they're finding in the West, shipping them back east, and transporting them to Europe. The North is also starting to build a series of canals, and later it will be trade, and the South is growing cotton. And this is leading to sectionalism. Different points of view. 
different points of view on life in the United States. The southern aristocracy, which is a very small amount of people, you know, we, we overplay the slavery thing in the amount of southerners that actually own slaves. Sure, there were a lot of slaves. There were up to four million slaves at any one time in the south, and that's a lot of slaves. But they were owned by a relatively small amount of people. Two percent of southerners controlled 90 percent of the slaves, and three quarters of southerners owned no slaves whatsoever. That small amount of people between the 2% and the 3 quarters that didn't own slaves own one or two. And in those situations, the slaves are very often treated as family members. This is not an attempt to legitimize slavery. Not trying to do that. But trying to show you that slaves belong to the wealthy. And since most of society is not wealthy, most of Southerners really didn't own slaves. But anyway, another topic, another time. This is going to feed into the idea of sectionalism, though as the South fights for the right to have slaves, and the battle will continue as we go forward. Okay, to advance this a little bit here. We talked about the whole idea of Jefferson and cutting taxes. Definitely does that. The Federalists disappear, for the most part, as they get absorbed into the Monroe cabinet in time to come. We talked about Marbury versus Madison and Preston. <coughs> One thing we didn't talk about was that the Federalists called the War of 1812 Mr. Madison's War, which certainly isn't a moniker any president wants to have. I'm sure George Bush would not have wanted to call Mr. Bush's War, but the Democrats tried nevertheless. In 1814, in an attempt to bring the war to an end, we get something called the Hartford Convention. The, Hart Convention, the Hartford Convention is a group of Federalists meeting in, New, meeting in Hartford, Connecticut, hence the term Hartford Convention. I miss it in New York meeting in Hartford, Connecticut, to say, well, listen, if we, don't, if we can't get out of this war, we want to secede. So he's threatening, they're threatening uh, the United States government with secession. Daniel Webster, by the way, is the leader of this convention. He's going to be the mouthpiece for the Northeast. John C. Calhoun will be the mouthpiece for the South. And Henry Clay is going to be the mouthpiece for the burgeoning West. John C. Calhoun being from South Carolina, Henry Clay being from Kentucky, and Daniel Webster being from Massachusetts. So, nevertheless, at the Hartford Convention, they come up with this list of grievances, and they decide that if Madison doesn't act on the grievances and end the war, they're going to secede. Madison caves and ends the war, and we get this Treaty of Ghent as a result of that. So, after the war, things settle down in the United States, we enter the era of good feelings. Not entirely good feelings, because there will still be disputes with the Missouri Crisis and the Panic of 1819, but nevertheless, the country is growing. As I said, it's a young child taking its steps now. The Federalist era was the baby, we are now the young child. We redefine our boundaries in this time period with the Louisiana Purchase expanding the size of the United States and doubling the size of the United States. So let's take a break, be right back. Just wanna briefly go over the American system, change my notes a little bit here, so we can see it clearly. The American system has three legs, like a three-legged stool. This is Henry Clay's idea, and it evolves. There isn't one day where it's called the American system. It evolves. And it's based on three basic ideas, that we need a national bank to support economic development. Thomas Jefferson did not believe so, but we do. We need, a, we need to move the money around the country and through the system. Well, where is that bank going to be funded? Largely from tariffs, and those tariffs are going to be used to protect American businesses. Remember, a tariff on an imported item makes that import more expensive. If we wanted to protect the American auto industry, we would put a tariff on imported cars. We'd make a Toyota Camry $10,000 more with a tax. A tariff is a tax. They mean exactly the same thing, but a tariff is a specific kind of tax. It is a tax on trade, items, on trade items, and the United States only has import tariffs, no export tariffs. So, anyway, getting back to the car idea. If we can make the Toyota Camry $10,000 more than a Ford Fusion or a Chevrolet Malibu, people would buy the Ford Fusion or the Chevrolet Malibu. That's the purpose of a tariff, to make imported goods more expensive so people will buy domestic goods. That's the second part of the American system, because that's where the funding is going to come from for internal improvements road and canal construction. So, three parts leading to the expansion of the American economy. A banking system, 
tariffs, and infrastructure improvements. The rest of these notes I'm not going to go through. They are also available on bushhistory.net slash YouTube, and you can take a look at them there. So this concludes the discussion on the Republican agrarian era of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, and the, co the gradual change from this agrarian idea to a market economy. The Supreme Court cases I alluded to earlier, there are pivotal Supreme Court cases I'm going to cover in a separate PowerPoint. Take a look on YouTube as soon as it's ready. So, have a good day. Until next time, this is Bush History.